like haunts? Yes. Do you like immersive theater? Yes. Do you like escape rooms? Yes. What's the safe word? My haunt life. Hello and welcome to the My Haunt Life podcast. I'm Mike. And I'm Russell. And Russell, we have done so much since the last podcast. This is going to be probably long and exciting. So I th- yeah, this uh, we've had a couple of really cool weeks, that's for sure. But wait, wait, Mike. Mike. What? <laughs> Did you notice? R- really? Yes. You're, we're in the you, middle of haunt season. You know podcasts are audio, right? I know, but we're in the middle of haunt season, so I pulled out the spider web tablecloth. I pulled out spiders. We have Stop saying pull out. It, <laughs> we have fake pumpkins on the table. I have a spooky candle, or as spooky no, as a... No, don't. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. As spooky as a white linen scented candle can be, oh, I, I have the spookiest linen scented candle I could find. I thought you were going to say something else. So... Uh, <laughs> So, but also, I mean, because it is Halloween, I I wanted to, all right, first of all, we have our standard, we have the Load O Snickers and Kit Kat, and a couple of Take Fives in there, too, just because they were on sale, and I like them. And by the way, I forgot to do this a couple podcasts ago, but Tim uh, wants to add another to the mix, and he is Team Tootsie Roll, so. I'm not down with Team Tootsie Roll. I'm not either, but, you know. It's it's a lonely world in the Tootsie Roll. I mean, the flavored Tootsie Rolls though are pretty good. So uh, okay, I mean Tootsie, they're they're hard. They're they're I I, I don't know. So that I, that was your big complaint. They're yeah, hard. I, I don't. They're chewy. You, they get stuck in your teeth because you your know, dentures can't handle them. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so no. So I I brought Halloween candy. I have spiders. I have fake pumpkins. I have a candle. Oh wait, wait, wait. Hold on. I got you a pumpkin pail to trick or treat when you go trick or treating this year, and inside you can choose to be. You want if do you want the the oh vampire gosh. candy? Can, can you just stop? Or do you want please? the mummy candy? So and also just just because it is Halloween, uh, I have pumpkin shaped peeps. So if you want those, we have those during the podcast. If you want to uh, eat those, um, ghosts. We have ghost shaped peeps. Um, also. Just for you, uh, pumpkin patch orange pop rocks. Because it's not Halloween without pop rocks, right? I wish the urban legends were true and I could just take that with Coke right now and just explode my stomach (laughs) and my head. I'm surprised you didn't say you wanted to do that to me. Cool, thanks. Are you done patting yourself on the back? Oh, come on. Can we start? Halloween is fun. Yes, but no one else can see this. I, I... I'm enjoying it. Then maybe <laughs> cut all of this out then. No, no. Our, mm. Here, here, here. The spider's Just, moving closer to you. Can we start? This yes. This is ridiculous. Okay, we can start. This isn't about us. Happy Halloween, Mike. It's not Halloween yet. I know, but happy haunt season. Oh my God. So the first thing we did since the last podcast is Zombie Joe's Urban Death's Tour of Terror. And this is something that we do every year because... Oh, well, I mean, we do Urban Death. Uh, it's like every few months they, mm-hmm. they have a new show or an updated show. But for October, for Halloween, they add a little tour of terror in front of it. Really? That's what it's called, man. Okay. All right. Just because I'm not down with your, like, your spoopy stuff like doesn't mean anything. <laughs> really? Spoopy? Really? Hey, I'm... I'm How not... dare you? <laughs> Hey, Spoo- spoopy is not a word. Spoopy does not exist. Says the guy with a spooky fresh linen candle. Hey, <laughs> it was it was the spookiest candle I had. So, um, yes, uh, Zombie Joe's Urban Death Tour of Terror. So, what did you think of uh, this year? It has my new favorite scene from an Urban Death. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Wow. It encapsulates exactly what urban death is to me really it's it's effed up it's there's a little bit of humor dark humor very dark and i mean this this specific scene started the show and it's like how can you like how can you like you see that for the first time like 
for your like if it's your first time at urban death like that is like just a what wtf moment of what did i get myself into is the rest of the night gonna be like this yes it is oh and it it, uh, it, it just gets worse <laughs> and darker from there the opening scene is literally like a blowtorch to the eyeballs it just it is just <laughs> I was stunned into silence. That sounds like a good thing if we were in hostel. So, uh, yeah, probably. Mm. All good, right. Good to know. Okay. All, All right. right. <laughs> no, I I agree with you. It. Uh, I I wouldn't say that's my new favorite scene, but I will say that it was. I was shocked and slightly appalled <laughs> at the ending of that sequence. Well, the the ending is great because I mean, if you're a, any sort of prevert you know that those things don't connect yes so <laughs> uh it, it's it, let's just say it's a very graphically sexual sequence that you sort of had to wrap your imaginative mind around exactly what was going on uh and don't forget the sound effects oh the sound effects were amazing uh <laughs> so uh and also i i there was some really great I, I there's god there's several things i want to touch on first of all how was your audience dude it was good my audience was spectacular because you could tell that it was a bunch of people who didn't know what they were getting into nice and there were several moments including that opening sequence uh there was someone near me uh, I, I think if you know anything about Zombie Joseph, you've heard us talk about in the past, nudity is a possibility. Possibility. <laughs> <laughs> and there were several people after that first sequence around me, they were like, what? She, she's like, it's like they, 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 they were naked. They were naked. They were naked. I was like, oh, this is going to be a fun crowd. <laughs> <laughs> because if that was the first sequence and my audience was filled with people who every scene blew their mind. That's awesome. And it was so much fun. And I think because I've been to so many uh, urban death shows and, and their haunt stuff, and I, I go to their regular shows, and which is also sometimes dark and creepy and moody. And I, it, it takes me by surprise sometimes when I'm w and with a crowd that was so fresh and into it. And my crowd was so into it and so stunned and so shocked they could not believe what they were witnessing which made it so much more exciting and so much fun for me knowing that like oh this is only going to get crazier and i will say that they're one of their simplest effects they do something that you've seen in multiple horror movies they, it's a simple effect it involves an actor moving around the stage uh in dim lighting but it's very creepy it's very moody it's very spooky mike my audience went freaking berserk <laughs> because I think, I think what it is, and I, I, I couldn't figure out why, why this, like, why is this getting this reaction? And I think what it is, is it's something that you see often in horror movies. It's just the image of, oh, that actor is moving in a way that humans really can't. But it, oh, it's probably CGI or something, but yeah, to see exactly. it in front of you. That's it. That's exactly it. This audience was witnessing this live and their minds were blown and i had i was laughing so hard and i was so happy that i got to witness this with so many people who were just blown away by it and so excited by it and cheering and stomping their feet and clapping and uh yeah this this was really really good so uh what did you think of the maze it's always tough to say something about the maze because you can't really see much yeah. And... Um, they give you, and for those that haven't been, they give you flashlights that are barely considered flashlights. They're very Because dim. Uh, they put tape around them, so the, the light that comes out is very, very dim. Um, so when you go through the maze and you encounter some characters in there, it's it, it definitely adds to it, but I think the flashlight I got was, was, was very dim because I could barely even see the outlines of things. Yeah, I, 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 I'm the, one of the reasons I want to ask that question is I was in the same situation and except I didn't have a flashlight. I was in a group of three. They gave flashlights to the other two people and they freaking left me behind. <laughs> so I was caught in that maze with no light whatsoever. And I know at one point I actually touched a performer 
in the dark trying to... I You're was... always touching actors, man. <laughs> no, by accident, because I was literally using... I was touching the plastic, trying to feel the plastic, and the plastic gave away, and I know I touched someone's shoulder or something. I hope it was their shoulder. Um, I, I thought the flashlights were a little too dim, because I literally, when the people walked away from me and left me behind, I couldn't find them mm -hmm. because it was so dark in there. So I kind of waited, and then another group kind of caught up to me, but I know what they were doing is they didn't want to catch up to the next group. So anytime they saw me, they stopped. Right. So I was really caught. And so I didn't see much of the intro maze, the way into the show. Uh, and on the outward maze, because they changed the maze as the show is being performed. And so you exit through a different maze than you enter. I will say this, Mike. Uh, you know me. I have a problem with certain insects. There was one image in the maze going out that was so, I, I had a flashlight on the way going out. I did the classic stop and I just had to look at it because it was so horrifyingly weird and tragic and upsetting. It was, and it, it was just like, I love it when they do that. And they've done that a couple of times in their maze. Uh, do you know what I'm referring to? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, so it involved, uh, let's say an insect attacking a person. And uh, it, it was really disturbing. And I probably just gave too much away for those of you going to see it. But it, it, like, that image was so cool for me because it just turned my stomach. So, but, uh, and also, I want to I wanna really say I appreciate the fact that they bring some classics back. That's one of the things I was going to mention because some of the scenes you've seen before if you've been to Urban Death. But it doesn't matter because they're so powerful and they're so, dare I say, fun mm -hmm. uh especially if you you don't know what's coming so when there's a certain scene that will cause people to probably jump out of the way mm -hmm. and you see other people see it for the first time that makes it that much better yeah absolutely Actually, the, the moment that you're referring to, I think a couple of years ago, I said that was the best scare of my entire haunt season. Yeah. And like I said, my audience was so filled with first timers to Zombie Joe's Underground Theater. That scare was amazing because it caused a ripple through the audience physically. That's awesome. It literally, people were so taken aback and so frightened. You, you physically saw the entire audience ripple backwards. It was that good. So, yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was a fun time. Another thing, too, that I, it seemed was the maze had more twists and turns. I don't yes. know if you felt felt that as well. I did feel that way. Okay. And also, I felt it was narrower this year. Yes, definitely. And that, which is probably how they were able to get more twists and turns <laughs> in there. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed this year. Yeah, I did too. I always enjoy this. I mean, Urban Death is great, but when you add a, a haunted maze in front of it, it just makes it that much better. For more information on Zombie Joe's Underground Theater and Urban Death, you can find them on the web at zombiejoes.com, on Facebook, ZJU Theater, and that's theater spelled T-E-R, on Instagram and Twitter, Zombie Joe's. Another thing that we seem to love every year is a show called Creep. And not just because we are creeps, but because <laughs> the show is really fun. And it has been since I started. It was, what, four years ago? I believe it Three was. Three years ago? Yeah. And uh, this year, Creep LA presented a show called Awake, which was centered on nightmarish visions, I guess would be the way to put that. Yeah. As if you uh, have fallen asleep and are witnessing nightmares or possibly your own nightmares, possibly other people's nightmares. Uh, and you're led through a series of very surreal, very oddball nightmares. And like previous creeps, this is done in a group, but you get split apart into, I guess, I guess you can call them tracks in this one. Yeah, I, there seemed to be a little less individual action this year at Creep, which is, it was fine by me. Uh, one of the things I noticed this year, uh, I've I've said this before about Creep, sometimes I feel they get a little clunky with their flow of patrons i did not feel that this year in any way i thought they handled the crowd really well it's it's an audience of 25 people at a time 
And I thought the transitions between sequences, I thought moving from nightmare to nightmare, all of that played seamlessly for me. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I, ne I never felt like we were in a spot where we had to wait for another scene to finish or for another group to move on or something like that. Where, right. you know, in the not necessarily creep, but in the past, you've definitely felt this within shows that have different tracks for, for different groups of people. Right. Um, but the, the track I was on, man, like it was like, I know, like I've heard people talk about dreams and nightmares like this. Mm -hmm. So it was really, it was really cool to see and experience a certain thing. Um, I will just say a bedroom over and over again, and hopefully that's not giving too much away, but seeing that and experiencing that, it felt like a dream. Oh, interesting. And it was really, it was really, really cool the way they did that. Yeah, I definitely did not have that track. I had a really nightmarish family sequence. And then I had a very personal nightmare. Uh, a woman described a nightmare and you met the, the, the man from the nightmare. And kudos on the makeup design, kudos on the set. The space that they have to play in this year is amazing. And... I thought they did very well at choosing what to represent of the physical world and what to represent of the dream world, if that makes sense. Uh, it, they really did manage to create, what was it, a 75-minute show, I guess? About that. Yeah. And you really did feel as if you weren't totally conscious, if that makes any sense. Yeah, because some of the, the things that were happening and some of the things being said it made you think that you were actually going crazy or you were in a dream. Yeah. yeah. And, and I had one really nice sequence where I was listening to what was going on and suddenly somebody was whispering in my ear, telling me that what I was witnessing was false. And that went on several times. And I thought that was a wonderful, because if, you, if you've ever had a dream where this feels wrong, but I can't tell what's wrong, that's what they created for me live in this theater piece. And I thought that was utterly fascinating. Yeah, and it's really, I mean, obviously we're into horror and horror yes. movies. I, I felt like I was an extra in Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, interesting. Because don't fall asleep, stay awake. And the fact that everybody around you is like, we can't fall asleep, you need to stay awake. I was like, oh crap, if I fall asleep, I'm gonna die. <laughs> like that's the, and not necessarily by Freddy Krueger, but just the fact that, no matter like if I do fall asleep, something bad will happen. Well, actually, somewhere during the show, I know I did hear the question posed of, you know, the mythology that if you die in your dream, yeah, you, you die, die in real life. So, which I know that isn't true because believe me, I've died in my dreams before. So, and luckily, uh, knock on wood, that uh, hopefully that will not come true someday. And here's the record needle scratch. Thanks for the, the support on that. Thank you for being there for me. I appreciate the support. <laughs> we, what? <laughs> you were supposed to offer comfort at that moment. Oh, we're all going to die at some point. <sighs> wow. Some sooner than others. Great. Thank you. Not, I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying everybody dies. Okay. Just like everybody pays taxes. <laughs> so, all right. So uh, Creep LA, the show is awake. I, I Like I said, I really loved the, the feeling, the flow, the quick movement. It, I found it also interesting that they were able to manage moving a large group of people very quickly at one point, which I found utterly fascinating, the way they, they trafficked that and the way the flow went together so well for, and seamlessly brought you what we were all in individual dreams. And then one moment, everyone in the group had to come back, back together. And it felt like a dream sequence because suddenly, rather than being with four other people, I rushed through an area and then appeared and there were 25 people there. And it's like, it's that kind of moment that when I was complimenting the flow earlier, that's, I think what I was referring to specifically is the, the seamlessness from sequence to sequence of suddenly 10 people disappear. And you didn't even notice that they were moving on. And you can't see where they are. Yeah, and you can't see them or hear them. So I, I, it's like this really is a very surreal, nightmarish feeling show with some wonderfully creepy imagery. And uh, I really, really enjoyed uh, going through this. And, and I loved where it went near the end. 
So I think this goes hand in hand with what you're talking about, but this, just how big the space was, mm -hmm. it's not very often that you are allowed to run or be forced to run. And I was forced to run at certain times during this. And it was awesome right? because there is so much room and you didn't have to worry about running into something or, or knocking something over or tripping or, you know, or anything like that. It, yeah. The fact that you can do that, it, like, I think it adds because we're so used to going through things and like walking either a certain path or, you know, don't run, don't be careful because everyone's concerned about safety mm -hmm. and granted, yeah, there's obviously going to be safety issues, but the fact that you don't have to really worry because it's so open and there aren't tripping hazards or anything like that. Like it definitely adds to the show. Yeah. It's a beautiful space. It sounds like you had a darker track than I did. Hmm. Judging from just a couple of things that you've said. And, um, I'm jealous of that. <laughs> <laughs> I want my nightmares darker. So <laughs> yeah, that was, it was a really, really good time. Definitely. Um, and speaking of different tracks, I make a joke each year about, well, it's haunt season because, and I, I can't really say it because it will be a spoiler for creep, but haunt season has officially begun. Thank you MV for doing the annual tradition of what you do because it's official. It happened. So thank you for that. Uh, very funny. Um, I know the performer you're referring to. <laughs> I know what you're referring to. I did not get that in my show. However, that particular performer who knows because we've attended so many shows that that particular actor has been in, I didn't know he was in this cast before going in. And at one point, I sensed someone standing next to me and I looked down and he sort of like at that particular moment, he touched me and said something and he actually scared me. Nice. And it was just, and I was like, damn it. <laughs> like, <laughs> really? It was just like, and it was just like, ah, that's, that's nice. So and I, was like, I had no idea that particular actor was in this show. One of the things you mentioned earlier is you felt that it went uh, a little bit away from the more intimate one-on-one -on -one type scenarios where you get pulled away and that was one of the things I noticed as well. Like when I left the show, I was like, wait a minute, this didn't, I really didn't see this happening. At least on, on the track I was on, I did get pulled away for, for a scene with someone else. And that was the only thing. But I remember say last year, people could get in a coffin. People could mm -hmm. get taken by, you know, a kill, a wood kill the woodsman or, right. you know, like it just seemed there were many more scenes that you could, get pulled away to get a secret thing or get told something. And it didn't seem like that happened this year. I know that in one of the scenes, which I don't think, I don't know if you got, but the, like the sort of creepy family scene, we were divided and a couple people got pulled away, but didn't leave the area. If that mm. makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So like somebody pulled them aside and was whispering in their ear or showing them something specific in the room, but that's not necessarily being pulled away the way that, that you're referring to in past years. And I was fine with that. Yeah. I'm not saying it as a complaint. It's just something I noticed because the show was strong. It's oh yeah. Just... I think personally, I think this is the strongest creep show I've ever attended. Like I think awake is their strongest work so far. Hmm. But would strongest mean your, it's your favorite? I think probably this is my favorite. Really? Yeah. Okay. Even even though, like I said, I, I kind of desire that it had been a little bit darker in tone for me personally. And I think there are probably darker tracks than the ones I got. But yeah, I think this is my favorite creep show so far. Wow. Interesting. So, what would be your, your favorite? Um, probably if we're talking strictly creep, I would say probably that first year, um, when it was, it was just more of a haunted house, it, more of a haunt. It was more horror, more there was some scary urban mythology going on mm -hmm. in that one. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think what added to that was it was the new kid on the block. It was their first year. Nobody really knew anything about it. And I think that added to the fear of going in. Ah, that um, makes sense. But I loved last year, but I don't necessarily call that a creep show because it wasn't creep. It was Amazon lore. So it's a weird, it was a tie in. Yeah. yeah. But I love last year too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think I preferred this year. 
I really do. I think the imagery in this year is beautiful. Uh, and I think it delivers exactly what they intended. It's a dream. Mm -hmm. it, it's a weird, frantic at times, wonderful dream. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And like I said, it could be darker for my taste, but what I saw was pretty damn dark in places. And again, I want to say great makeup in a few of the places in particular. The makeup played a huge factor in one scene in particular for me. And it created a, an imagery of one person that was haunting someone else's nightmares. And I would be haunted too if I ever encountered that man. It's like It was effective. It really was. I think I know the man you're talking about. Oh, did you meet him too? Uh, I did. Interesting. But it was, almost, it was only more of like a... We turned around and he was there and it was like, oh, crap, like we're going <laughs> to die. Uh, no, we actually got a bit of his story. And oh, cool. I didn't actually, get that. Oh, he interacted with one of the, the other cast members and the physical movements of that character were so strange, unnatural. They did not seem like a human being was, was moving through the space. It was really well done. So one more thing that I want to bring up and because I like to think I'm polite most of the time, like mm -hmm. I was raised with manners. I don't, I never want to, to offend anyone or seem, seem to be rude at, don't give me that look. <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean like, you know, like, you know, especially with older people, you know, such as yourself, um, <sighs> you made me do it, man. Like that's what that look happens. But anyways, in the show or before the show, we're given rules. Yes. One of the rules is do not speak. Yes. N and like that's basically it. Don't speak. And I had a scene where I was asked a question. And because the rules, I sh just shook my head uh, like yes or no or whatever I did. Mm -hmm. And then, but they, then the actress played on that. And was like, what cat got your tongue? And, and I held, you know, held my throat. It was like, <clears throat> you know, like that. But it's, it's, it's always weird when we're giving that rule, but then it seems like we can't interact. And I feel bad because I didn't want to ruin that actor's time right. or by not like by pretending to not play along when I totally want to play along. Right. It, it, it's interesting because, and we, we talked a podcast or so ago about, um, you know, agency and movement and behavior of patrons. And uh, I think the parallel to what you just said of don't speak, be quiet. And then they start asking you questions. Yeah, it, it is a confusion. And the other one is don't touch the actors. And then an actor hugs you. And I mean, you were, uh, we did a show. Wow. Year and a half ago where you know, the rules were in place about not touching and you watched as an actress came over and literally full on kissed me. And I remember in that moment, like uh, my natural urge to is to embrace the actor and she's <laughs> embracing me and kissing me. And I'm, and, and, but it was, it was, it was that moment of what do I do? Yeah. Because and... technically I want to play along with the scene but I am in no way going to, you know, I literally just, you know, pulled my hands back and in the, and I literally gave the actress complete control. Mm -hmm. of, it's just like, whatever she does is on her. So with, with the touch aspect, one of the things I started doing is if they initiate first, like it's, I go through with it if it's not anything crazy. Yeah, the most common thing is a hug. Yeah. Like, I've been hugged so many times in immersive shows. W we went to a show in Vegas, which we'll get to later, but there was uh, an actress bawling her eyes out. And she looked at me, and my initial thought is to just go grab her and hug her. Right. But instead what I did is just I held my arms out. So if she wanted to do that, I knew it was okay. Right. So she came and hugged me, so that's when I hugged her. But I didn't just go up to her because right. that would be, you know, it's a weird line. Yeah. It, it's funny. Cause I, I've, yeah, that's a better example than the one I gave. It's a less extreme example. And I think it's the more common one that you would encounter. So yeah, it is, it is confusing. And I, I am okay with that confusion to some degree, but you're right. I, you just have to play it in the moment. You have to just figure it out in the moment. Mm -hmm. And, but yeah, there have been times when I wanted to respond and I'm like, Oh wait, I'm not supposed to, I think. Right. So yeah, it causes a little hiccup sometimes. 
so yeah, that was just a, a tiny thing I wanted to bring up because I know we were we were talking about it not on a podcast, like on the way to Vegas. So I figured, hey, let's yeah. look. And we talked about it a couple podcasts ago in another forum. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Uh, however, getting back to creep, surreal, nightmarish, creepy, and just a lot of fun. And I feel like this is something that could go on beyond Halloween. I would love that personally. Because it's not like, it's not, it's creepy. It's not really horror, so it doesn't have to fit into October. Yeah. You know? I don't know. No, I agree with you completely. And for more information on Creep Los Angeles and their show Awake, you can find them on the web at creepla.com, on Facebook, JFI Productions, also on Instagram and Twitter, JFI Productions. So the next event that we went to, Mike, was also very theatrical. Oh, yes and very... so much so it's in its name yes uh we attended theater macabre which is brought to you by the creative team behind the experiences or as we probably know it more by the tension experience and the lust experience <laughs> this is a live event which is going on in downtown los angeles it is a show where you enter a building where there is a theatrical production going on and being housed, and you interact with characters in and around that world. I'm already fumbling on how to talk about this. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's When I left this show, uh, the biggest thing I could compare it to was if you could talk to the actors at Sleep No More, that's the show. Okay. I can see that comparison. Yeah, because it's... it's pretty open world you can wander around you're not stuck on a certain track that you'll get yelled at if you move off of it's 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 incredible like not there's nothing that can even compete and compare to this right now yeah this is uh there's wow you begin this way you enter a building and you get the standard sort of onboarding sequence where the rules are set up of you can go almost anywhere you want, except you can't open closed doors. You can talk to anyone. If there's a character, you can walk up and talk to them. And basically the rules are if they want to engage you, I mean, obviously if they're talking to someone else, like you should be respectful, be polite. Well, that's one of the rules that not, I got. Yeah, not interrupt someone. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they're talking to you or if they're talking to others, you know, don't, I guess the, the, the layman's way of saying that is don't force yourself into a situation that obviously somebody else is enjoying or taking part in. Uh, and you start meeting interesting, odd characters right from the moment you walk in the building. Some are performers, some are workers. Yeah. And this is, this is all based around something called the theater macabre, which the performance uh, there is actually performances going on during the course of the evening. Uh, however, before you get into that theater, you encounter numerous characters, some of who, some who work at the theater, others who are there perhaps as patrons or guests of the theater, perhaps to find out more about the world that you are also exploring you don't really know anyone's motivation until you start talking to people. And that's what's really exciting because there is no lore with this. Whereas the tension experience and the lust experience, there was an ARG going up until the show started for, for months and months, even up to a year. And you basically have to follow along if you wanted to know like who this character was or, or why that character is doing this or, you know, whatever with this, this is a standalone plug and play. You show up, you know, as much as anybody else there. Yeah. You don't have to be a, a celebrity to get a, something special or a VIP or follow along for the last two years and know everyone's name and backstory. Nobody knows anything. You just go and your night depends on you and who you interact with and what questions you answer. It's basically a live version of the butterfly effect. Yeah, that, that, I think that's an interesting way of putting that. Um, now, I, I, what happened for me, Mike, is I connected early on with a particular character. That character actually really approached me. 
um, we kind of like our eyes met and he noticed what I was wearing and he was wearing a much more flamboyant version <laughs> of what I was wearing. <laughs> but he like, he kind of looked me up and down and, and he started talking to me and I immediately engaged with him and, and started asking him questions and he wanted to know how I'd found out about the show. He wanted to know what I was doing at theater macabre. He wanted to know what I was interested in. And I started playing into that. And to be totally honest, Mike, I found myself not acting, but sort of like, Oh, well, I wonder if I say I'm interested in this, where will this conversation turn? And so I started to dropping in things of like, Oh, well, I'm, I am interested in dark stuff. I'm interested in deviant stuff. Like so I started <laughs> I started going into that sort of conversation and he picked up on it and altered it and ran with it and and he and suddenly I found like oh we have a connection. He said that to me and he said I think you're someone I can trust. I think I'm going to give you some information. And suddenly I am literally being pulled out of the room, downstairs, into other rooms. He wants to get me alone. He turns away another person, you know, that, that is trying to get involved. Like it, all of this happened suddenly really fast. And he gave me some information and he said, there's stuff here that you're going to be interested in. There's stuff here for you to learn. Go. And it was the beginning of, I, I know a very specific track. I was from that point forward, I was on a track for the entire night mm -hmm. and I kind of got distracted a couple of times by a couple of, uh, of performers who didn't necessarily take away from my track, but I realized like, oh, this is like a red herring and a mystery. The fact that I'm having this conversation. And then, uh, one person in particular stopped me and started asking me questions about why I was there that night. And I said, well, I don't, I don't really have, and she started asking me questions about what I knew. And I told her, I said, I don't know the answer to the questions you're asking, but I have a question for you. It's like, I've met some mysterious people here this evening. What about this? What do you know? And she gave me some information. See, and just the fact that you asked a question back yeah. is huge and they play along with it and it's so good. Yeah, and there was and there was a, we were right at a doorway at that point and something was said in the other room and she heard it and I thought like, "Oh, wait, did I did I hear that correctly in the other room?" And she looked at me and she was like, "That's what you're looking for." I said, "You heard that too." And she's like, "Oh, yeah." And so I knew that, "Oh, I I'm going to go into that other room." And I and and there was a there was a character called the MC which you probably encountered as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, they came over, they talked to me and they gave me really bizarre information. I thought like they, they, they started oversharing and I don't mean that in a bad way, right? <laughs> but they were, and they were nervous and I was trying to figure out why they were nervous. And then something happened in that room and it kind of affected what I was looking for. So I started tracking people down and I walked out and I walked up to one of the cast members and I said, you need to tell me this. And they were like, oh, well, if you're really interested in that, you need to go find it out. You need to go over there. Maybe you can do it. Like they, they were encouraging me. Like they weren't spoon feeding you. No. But, and they, it, and I literally said, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be, I'm trying to be non-spoilery, but also get the, the vibe of what I was wearing. When I walked out of that one room, and I looked at the first actor, uh, actress I saw. I was like, what just happened? Where is this person? I want to know. And they went, well, maybe you should go find out. <laughs> and it dawned on me. I was like, oh, my God. I, I'm actually, I, I can go and find out. And I literally went down hallways wow. calling out. It was like, hey, you. Like, you, where do you go? Where do you go? And... They found me like, and, and they didn't trust me because why was I hunting them? Mm -hmm. So that, and I'm literally all of that happened in about 35, 40 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so it was so fast. And it, and it was this electrifying moment of, because earlier I had been given a piece of information of like, Hey, if, if you find this 
And and by pieces of information, I don't think I, I think it's well known about the show. If you're reading anything about it, is like I was given a secret phrase, mm-hmm. and I had to find the person to say that phrase to, and that person gave me something else, which gave me more information, and that led to something else. I got so giddy when I got a secret phrase too, mm-hmm. because it's just. It's like, oh my God, I earned this. Like this person trusts me. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it is like, it's such a cool feeling. And, you know, obviously that led to something which led to something which led to something. It That's just the start of the rabbit hole. Yeah. And it's interesting that you say you, like you felt you were on a track because for me, even though I, I, in the back of my mind, it's like, okay, this is, this is my track. I didn't feel like it because when I got that phrase and I, I had to tell someone, I had to find that person, tell them things happened before and after that, that I don't think was a part of it. And Mm -hmm. what, what I mean by that is things happened that because I noticed something in the corner of a room. And so even though I might've been on a path, the fact that it could have it altered and it took a side side detour Mm -hmm. and then got back on because I noticed something like that makes it the show that much more incredible to me. Right. Because it's like they allow for things like that to happen. It's not just, okay, Mike's on path a Russell's on path B. That's it. You know, no, no audibles or anything that's it yeah and and i think what happened with me is you know i i made a decision and then uh, uh like three quarters of the way through all of this somebody finally gave me a goal a really specific like i want you to help make this happen and i'll just flat out say i failed i couldn't make it happen so that's a storyline. I bet I'm, I am a hundred percent confident that if I had chosen to do something differently, I would have succeeded, but I didn't. And that sort of ended that whole quest that I was on. Um, and actually that's, you know, it's, it's, it's what you were saying about things can change and things can move around. There were a couple of times, like I said, that I was I talking to people who I don't think were part of my story either, but the underlying track was always there. Mm -hmm. I was looking for someone specific. Right. And the thing that I noticed, well, the the thing that I talked about noticing something in the corner of a room, Mm -hmm. I noticed where someone went and someone randomly came in minutes later. Did anybody see where this person went? I was like, Oh yeah, it went that way. It's like, follow me. And I was like, what? Right. Oh my God. Like this, this is not part of my, like, you know, like, ah, but here's the thing, Mike, is so when I got, I, I got told uh, very, very specifically, I knew that I had failed and I watched something very unpleasant happen because I failed. Mm-hmm. So that was part of the storyline. And then I got pulled back into a larger group. And here's the thing about this is kind of an open world and you can explore because I was exploring what I was exploring. When I got pulled back into the larger group, that story didn't quite make as much sense or have the emotional impact, which I think the creators probably wanted it to have because I didn't have the setup. Right. I had spent the previous hour chasing down all this other stuff. So that final sequence wasn't as impactful as what had happened 10 minutes before. If right. That makes sense. Yeah, I get that. So, so there, there is some, there were some bumps in the road for me during this. And that was one of them. The other one is the first character who who told me to go looking for the information that I was looking for, flat out said, like, and at the end of your journey, at the end of, he didn't, I don't think he used the word journey, but he said at the end of the night, it's like, you're going to have to explain what you learned. It's like, and he, and he was very adamant about that. So when I failed, I was completely filled with dread Mm -hmm. because the one thing I knew is I was going to have to explain myself to somebody. I didn't know who that never happened. Oh, I never met. Nobody ever asked. I was pulled into one more scene and then the show was over and I was thrown out of the building. Maybe it's this guy right here. 
Whenever you look in the mirror, <laughs> you're pointing at me. <laughs> yeah. You have no, to no. explain it to yourself. No, no. So what, what you did. Um, so, so like I said, there were some non sequiturs. We were there opening night, mm -hmm. halfway through opening night or, or closer to the end of opening night. And so there were some non sequiturs here and there. I tried to engage with one character who she and I had this amazing flirtatious kind of sexy, like really cool moment. It's weird to picture you flirting. Oh, you should see it. It's I awkward want, as hell. I don't it's, want it's to. It's really <laughs> awkward as hell. I have no game. Uh, but we had that moment and it led nowhere. I mean, she literally like turned her back on me and walked away basically, <laughs> which that is usually the way flirting works for me, <laughs> actually. So if you really want to get down to it. So maybe this is closer to real life than I really even want to admit. So, uh, but uh, damn it, you've completely distracted me, Mike. <laughs> I am completely regretting certain aspects of my life right now. Um, but uh, the thing about this is, and, and I've, we've talked about variations on open world before. Uh, Sleep No More is maybe the, you know, the, the gold standard of open world where you can explore and you can find scenes or whatever. I will be the first to say I enjoyed Theater Macabre much more than Sleep No More. Well, the thing with Sleep No More is... It, like first of all it's beautiful oh this, yeah because it's been there forever the set design is is just amazing but you're basically just playing back something over and over again yeah the scenes don't change you know where someone's going to be at a certain time here with within theater macabre it's all bets are off like you can't go a second time i'm i'm i haven't been a second time yet but i'm guessing you can't go a second time and wait by a staircase for someone to come down no i i because I, there's so many different variables they might be talking to someone else and it's 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 organized chaos yeah yeah i i find this utterly fascinating and i think the creative team behind theater macabre are just blowing open the idea of interactive immersive theater it's like i think this is an important show i really do i think this is like this will influence other shows in los angeles oh yeah like this is this, this is sort of a like this is patient zero for something i just don't know what yet it, so, i mean it's an evolution look at tension we were saying the same things about um the tension experience ascension oh yeah absolutely and this is the next level of that yeah they, they've taken the, the, the good stuff and expanded on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting to me. It's like you, I'm going to digress for a moment, as I sometimes do. Uh, you know, there's a show called Blackout, which I'm fond of. <laughs> okay. So. Which we've never talked about before on right. this podcast. Um, and I think when we interviewed uh, the, the director of the Blackout Experiments documentary, uh, Rich, he was he came on the podcast uh, and we talked to him. I think I said this during that interview that the first time I ever went to Blackout, I didn't go for a haunt experience. I had heard about Blackout. I heard the you go through alone. I heard the the stuff about it. And the first time I ever went to Blackout and I bought a ticket and went, Mike, I wanted to know how the structure worked. That was my first time at Blackout, and I walked through the door and was completely blown away by what happened. Yeah. But my reason for going was to figure out, how can they make money at this? How can they control one person at a time and, and get more, multiple people through a show? It's like, like what, how long is the show? How do you control this? How, do, how does the flow work? Because I've worked in haunts. I've worked in live theater. So the first time I ever went to Blackout was an experiment in figuring out the structure. Would you say it's a Blackout experiment? Oh, wow. Starring Russell Eaton <laughs> as victim number one. Really? Um, I so want to know more about the mechanics and the mechanisms in motion at Theater Macabre. It's like just as someone who's helped create other stuff, as someone who loves the immersive genre overall and someone who loves haunts and someone who's got improv training in my background. And, you know, it's like, I, I want to know more about the mechanics of this. I find this utterly fascinating on every level from behind the scenes to being a patron. 
I think this is completely original and unique and it is it, 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 it's like the flame you keep wanting to touch because you know you're going to be burned but it's an interesting feeling. It's like I want to go back, I want to know more about how it runs and I you know I'm the type of person that if I know more about how something runs it doesn't ruin the experience for me. I'm not one of those people who's like, "Oh, I can't know any of the secrets." I, I want to know more. Like they have created a world and I want to know more about it. Oh, definitely. I totally agree. And by the time this podcast comes out, I will have gone a second time. Yeah. I, I am I'm not lined up to go a second time yet. So I, I, I am seriously considering it though. Definitely. I hope they extend. I do too. It's like this run is very short. And, and another thing that we should address is the ticket price is steep. Mm hmm. It's an expensive ticket. It's one of the more expensive tickets during the haunt season. But for what you get, it's worth every penny. Um, you get, I mean, my show seemed the majority of it were one-on-one -on -one interactions. There was yes. very, very little group. So you're getting a personalized experience. And apparently there's an open bar. Like I don't drink, but I guess alcohol is included too. Uh, yeah, I only... Um... Oh, I was about to say something that'd be a bit spoilery. Yeah, I had to find the bar at one point for, mm. for, for reasons of that I don't want to go into. But yeah, there there was a bar. Um tip your waitresses people. Uh there would be a bartender. That too. There's no waitresses. <laughs> so I didn't know I wasn't in any of the tables in the theater long enough to know if there were waitresses running around or not. Um and what's up with the, I, I don't want to say what it is, but on one of the tables in the theater, did you notice a bunch of items? Um, I didn't know what to do with those. I found them and I was like, eh, do I need to take these to someone? Should I take one of these home with me? I don't know what is going on. I don't know why. Like these, I walked up to a table and there were all these things laying on it. I was like, what does this do? What, like, how can I make use of this? So yeah, there's lots of stuff going on. This this whole open world experiment, and I'm someone who overall hasn't enjoyed open world experiments before now. I've always found them clunky and awkward, and and there was some clunky and awkwardness to, to this, but I think it was just because it was opening night. Uh, so yes, it's a steep ticket price, and I know people who are not going to this show because of the ticket price. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day who their response literally was when I, when I, they asked me the ticket price, they said, that's an entire day at Disneyland. That's 12 hours of entertainment for that same price. And you're saying you got 90 minutes. Yeah, but you're not going to be waiting in line for half of that. And, and I said, but it's a different world. It's like, I had to go in and find a story. I had to interact with people. And, you know, that person was fascinated by what I was saying but they didn't want to pay $150 because that, that's not right. where they, they would not have enjoyed it. When you can have conversations with Goofy, then we can make a comparison. <laughs> so yeah, there is value to this ticket. And also I realize what you're paying for is, and, and again, this shouldn't be a factor in your ticket. You're paying for the location. You're paying for the large cast. You're paying for the alcohol. You're paying for all of that. A patron shouldn't think about that, in my opinion. The patrons should think about the value of time and quality of show. And what you said, I think, is very true. The fact that you walk in and you're given this set of parameters that you can go and create your own evening by interacting with characters. You interact with these people and stuff happens because of your interactions. That's completely unique. That's the value of the ticket. That experience, I think, is the value of the ticket for me. Is that, and it sounds like you were heading in that direction before I interrupted you. Yeah. So thanks. Anything else? Um, one of the things that we've learned from the people behind this uh, with our past experiences, um, one of the things they always say is to be present. To put your phone down. Yeah. Just be there. And going back to what I said about noticing something in the corner of a room... I want to say that I saw quite a few things where the focus wasn't on it. It was more mm -hmm. of a background thing. Whereas I think if this were any other show, these would be main features of everybody come watch this. But here it was in the background and it was just such a nice touch because if this 
if the people behind the theater are evil and committing these these things, um, <laughs> they're not going to want to bring attention to it. Right. So, of course, it would be done without putting a focus on it of everybody look here. Right. And that, I don't know, something about that added so much to the night for me. Yeah, you were talking about... Uh, um dealing with characters and, and being led somewhere or whatever, I, I wound up in a room alone with one of the characters and I got a really wonderful story out of this character and it affected what I did for the rest of the night. It affected the actions I took. It affected who I talked to. Everything changed because I had that one conversation. Walking away from that conversation... I had, I had to go do something and I walked away from the conversation and I passed someone and you know, that feeling when you've invaded someone's space, but yeah. you don't exactly know why. Like, wait, wait, I, I'm sorry. I had that moment. They were so annoyed that I was walking through a room where they were and I want to know what's that guy's story. Right. I want to know, like, okay, was he hiding something? And I walked in at an inopportune moment. Like, was he frustrated at me? Or was he frustrated that anyone was present? Did he want to do something in private? Like, did he want to do something with the person I was walking away from? So that's the kind of moment where I I kept wanting to go, like, oh, but but I'm supposed to go find this information, but I really want to know what's up with that dude. And I want to, like, that happened several times to me. And I, and I want to, that's why I would want to go back is to talk to different people. And I would want to explore a couple of those moments. If I make someone uncomfortable, I want to know why. And because I felt like I was so focused on a singular track, looking for a certain information. It almost had blinders on. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a good way of putting it, actually. So you haven't said much about your interactions. Well, Yeah. What happens in the theater stays in the theater. <laughs> so did you feel that your, uh, what was the tone that, that, I think that's the question I want to ask. Like, was it comedic? Was it black comedy? Was it dark? Was it treacherous? Was it tragic? Was it sad? Like what, what did you get? It depends who I talked to. I was a social butterfly, man. Like I talked to as many people as I could. Um, I danced with a lovely lady. Um, I, someone was, another one was sitting alone. I went and talked to her and we had a conversation about tattoos and I had a conversation with the MC. I talked to, I talked to someone that, um, may have upset the MC. I talked to the hostess. I, I like, I talked to as many people as I could and each person had a different personality mm -hmm. and a different story and a different piece of the puzzle. But to like, I, it wasn't just a, Oh, overall it was this because it wasn't like everything was different. And that's the magic of this. Like it, because it is real, you know, you're dealing with real people and real personalities to a point. Right. And those conversations have real effects in that universe. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Because I, I, there was a shift in tone for me. It started out as a sort of awkward kind of comedic thing, then got very serious, then got very sad, and then got very tragic. So, but along the way, there was also some real mystery elements of like, why is this person telling me this? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and one... I would say one truly creepy moment where I don't want to. Well, yeah. I mean, I, in a roundabout way, got threatened. Uh, so yeah, I, I didn't get threatened, but I will say this. It was like, I was, somebody pointed out how vulnerable I was. Oh, well, that's not hard to do. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Uh, but no, it, it was, it was, it was a very creepy moment. And they, they, at the end of sharing some information with me, they pointed out of like, like, dude, you are standing in the middle of the room. And you, did you realize that that person right there? And I turned around and there was a person three feet away from me. It's like, that guy could kill you. It was like, it was that sort of feeling. Mm -hmm. It was like, 
do you know whether or not you can trust that person? And what about that person? And what about that? Yeah, person? I mean, we are about three feet away, so <sighs> I don't know if I trust you sometimes. I could kill you. <sighs> <laughs> but at least it would be interesting. <laughs> well, You'd make it interesting. Maybe. So, uh, I, 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 I'd shove Kit Kats up both of your nostrils and hold your mouth shut <laughs> so you couldn't breathe. <laughs> oh, if anyone can draw that. Oh, God. Adina, I'm looking at you. Oh, man. <laughs> You're twisted. Yeah, so Theater Macabre, a wonderful, weird experiment that I wish a long, healthy life to you personally. So, um, are you, are you, this is going to sound rude, but are you done talking about this? Or, like, do you have anything more to say? I have probably another hour's worth to go, but I think we should just call it at this point. Okay. Because there's, there's a special guest. No, don't get, don't freak out. Um, I'd like to welcome to the microphone conspiracy, Mike. Okay. Crazy Theory Mike. You may remember him from the Tension Experience podcast. Oh, and I remember experience. Conspiracy Mike very well. So, okay. Are you ready for this? So they've said, the creators have said in interviews that this is more of a plug and play. I even said it in this podcast. I was repeating what they have said for, you know, the people that may have not heard about this. But for the people that have been following along... Let's get some stuff down because I think there's more to this than meets the eye. I think it goes deeper and here's why. And I'm saying this and I don't think it's a spoiler because they posted her picture on Instagram and she's in the video, but Sabrina Kern is in the theater. Yes. I, I encountered Sabrina. I did too. Sabrina is the only link between tension, lust, and this, right. which means somehow there was probably something else going on. Like, and here's another thing. We talked, we talked about, like, we had someone in our group that's looking for information and it wasn't the same person. True. And hearing other people's accounts, it sounds like there's a different cast, you know, which obviously for a show like this, you yeah. can't have the same cast go on half hour intervals yeah, they for the same thing. Yeah. Conspiracy Mike says, this is a plot and a show put on by OSDM that's hiring different actors for each time slot. And Sabrina is the puppet master behind it all. Because why else would all of these things be happening? And then when we go back, you know, it's, it's a different hostess or it's a different like MC or something like that. There's, I, the, I think the OSDM is behind this dude. Okay. Give me a moment. My brain hurts. And I bet this is their way to get rid of, of excess inventory. Well, there's always been the underlying theories about information gathering. And they always wanted to know about our emotional reactions. Holy crap. Mm -hmm. There was a moment in my show, which I do not want to reveal... But very specifically, it was pointed out to me how emotionally I can react and how emotional I can get within shows. Data. Exactly. That was data that they knew about me. And the subject of emotion came up. Somebody came up and it was a wonderful moment. They grabbed me, pulled me close and literally pointed at my heart at that moment when it, when emotions were being discussed. So they obviously, that person was aware of how emotional I get and how emotionally I can get invested in something. So if this is data gathering and Sabrina, and look, Sabrina has all the information at this point. So I could certainly see her being in a position of power in a position of management where she is one of the people making sure information is being gathered. And I will say that my journey in theater macabre, there were certain parallels to something else I have experienced within this universe, the universe of the OSDM, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the fact by trying to throw us off by saying there's no, there's no history, there's no, you don't need to know anything. I think that is just a cover and that Darren and Clinton Gordon are pawns just like they were in lust and intention and the OSDM 
like and the clockmakers are the ones that are like okay we still need you because people trust you so you're gonna put on this little show and but we are still running things sabrina is our eyes and ears like don't don't try to do anything otherwise you're dead your family's dead all of that wow interesting there's more to it there there i know there's more to it there has to be i'm not gonna say what but sabrina did ask me an emotional question right at the beginning as soon as i walked in she asked me like would this interest you or would that interest you where do you stand so yeah. that could have been very easily just data gathering. they're updating their files yeah exactly damn you <laughs> Wow. Okay. The views expressed in this podcast are not of Russell's, <laughs> just Mike's, because <laughs> he's a weird nut that likes to think overthink about things. So yeah, you think I overthink. Okay. So anything else you want to say about Theater Macabre? I'm on to you, OSDM. <laughs> <laughs> Theater Macabre, focus, focus, Mike. Yeah, I'm on to you, OSDM. Uh, focus. What? So oh. they're behind it. They're, I'm convinced. Okay. All right. Fine. I would like to say to the OSDM, if you want information on Mike, feel free to call me. <laughs> they don't need you. <laughs> no, probably not, actually. <laughs> um, but anyways, for more information on Theater Macabre and to go to this show while it's still running, hopefully they extend, go to theater-macabre.com, and that's theater spelled T-R-E. Uh, and on Facebook, you can find out more information at the tension experience on Instagram, blood on the mezzanine and on Twitter, theater macabre one, the number one. Okay. Conspiracy Mike. I can't help it, man. <laughs> you got to look deeper sometimes. Uh, yes. Uh, so let's talk about other immersive stuff because you know, right now in Los Angeles, there seems to be a whole bunch of immersive stuff going on, and I, I would love to have more haunts to go to, dude, really. But uh, one of the highlights that I have been looking forward to for weeks, Delusion is back. Yes. And I was so excited when they announced that they were coming back this fall, and I am so happy to have them back on the scene because they were missed and we were lucky enough to attend and i would like to say the thing that i think everyone has been saying about this year's delusion show uh which is called the blue blade mm -hmm. it's not pure horror yeah which i personally found utterly fascinating and i really enjoyed yeah i and that's the thing because delusion has been super horror based and scary and creepy mm -hmm. and this had some of those elements oh, but it wasn't it. it wasn't like it was in years past but it's okay right and it's weird to say that uh this had more of a science fiction vibe and uh there is it's definitely still interactive uh because of the space they're in it lends itself to a very much more intimate feel i think than they've ever had before for me personally it felt that way because all of the spaces are more claustrophobic they're tighter you're going into smaller rooms they've kept the a cap on the size of the group the groups are smaller this year going through so what they've achieved is they've achieved a little mini adventure where there is a quest vibe i think about the whole show but because it's so small and intimate, it lends itself to a really wonderful feeling of involvement. And you really do feel immersed in this world. And when they start talking about some of the science fiction elements, you really have a feeling, I thought, Mike, that you did not know what the next room was going to reveal. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. It like it all worked. That's and that's the big thing because whenever you have science fiction in something like this, whether it be theater or a haunt, sometimes it can come off as cheesy and like, you know, there's weird, like, bloop, 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 you know, which is like for like sorry, what? time travel. <laughs> what? Bloop, 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 bloop. Um, like just weird science fiction noises. You oh, know? got it. Okay. And um, God, Russell. Um, but <laughs> a lot more often than not, 
those effects and the story becomes cheesy, but this didn't seem cheesy at all. Like, and it was very, it was a very serious tone. And I think what lends itself to that is, are the actors yes. and the set design and the, the writing, like all of those lined up to be a perfect mix to make it a serious story. Mm hmm. I thought the cast was extremely strong, and I think you need that when you're delivering science fiction type plot points. And uh, the, uh, Delusion has uh, has always been known for interactivity. You're given tasks to do. There are certain things when you're uh, searching for stuff or or trying to piece together clues that is all present in this show. Uh, but I really think the strength of this show for me lies in sort of the through line because you get something set up very early on about what you're trying to achieve. But I, wow, I don't want to say quite, I don't want to say it that way. Hold on. Uh, where the story takes you is more the adventure it's like it's it's that old quote. It's like the journey is more important than the destination. Mm -hmm. I think that really applies to this because when you when you do finally get to whether or not what you're trying to accomplish happens or whether it doesn't happen, I found the journey just to be a blast. And you're right. I think it's I think that has to rest squarely on the shoulders of the cast. Mm -hmm. And also the effects are wonderful. The sets are beautiful. Uh, there are a couple of really jaw dropping moments. Yeah. When you, when you realize where you are in, like in the real world, I mean, yeah. like you are in, you know, this specific space It's like, how the hell is this achievable in this space? Yeah. Because you look around and I am not here. I'm not in LA. I'm somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And you never for a second doubt that. Yeah, you are you are transported to another world completely. Mm -hmm. So and 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 the 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 decoration of the sets, the lighting, everything is utterly beautiful inside. And by beautiful, I mean dark and creepy, and, <laughs> and it sells a weird sci-fi story effectively. Um, you know, one of the things we mentioned about creep is it seemed like there was a lack of you know pulling people away. Um, delusion in years past, they they were kind of my introduction to that, like, Oh, come with me and do this kind right. of thing. And this year it's, you know, much like creep, it didn't seem to have as many of those moments. Yeah. There was definitely less of those, but I think because you're in a smaller group, I was fine with it. Yeah. And the smaller group definitely helped because it was more of a, a group effort for things you, you know, it, there didn't need to be one person to do thing to do a certain thing. There was a couple times where it, that was called for, right? Um, but overall, it was like, okay, we need to find this, so we all searched different parts of the room, or right. we all, you know, helped read something, or you yeah. know, or something like that. Yeah, and and I will I will say I you have no idea how horrified I was when I wound up being the person who suddenly had to start remembering numbers and locations. And <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, I am the wrong person in this group to have this task. <laughs> and that's why I started shouting numbers. I don't know if you noticed that that's what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, wait, <laughs> wait, I, I, I just got this whispered in my ear and I just started talking and like this number, this number, this number, hoping that other people would remember the sequence because I knew that if, if people turned to me later and said, what were you told? I would never be able to remember. So yeah, I had a personal panic moment right then. Uh, but you're right. I, I think there was a little less splitting off, but also I think partially that is because of the location, Mike, because those rooms are so small and intimate that it doesn't lend itself to a lot of multiple tracks, I think. Right. You know, and, and I'm fine with that. And I will say they, they achieve some really cool sets inside. Mind blowing. There's, there was one near the end that, that had kind of a, an adventurous task that we had to do that I really loved. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that was like, when I saw that, when I walked into the room, I saw that I was like, Oh, please let, please let that really be something. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it was, it was very cool. 
So yeah, congratulations on a really interesting twist in vibe and tone and uh, content. And it, it just, the delusion is back and they're really, really trying to do something different. And I love the fact that they're doing something different. And I, yes, I miss the horror a little bit, but there are horrific moments in this and they are threatening moments in this. And super creepy. Yes. Like panic stricken moments. Yeah. In years past, Delusion has also done it in actual homes mm -hmm. uh, and this year is not. So I'm hoping that there's, I'm hoping that they're able to extend because it's not in a house, right? you know, which lends itself to many, many more problems um, than an actual space. Uh, so fingers crossed. Yeah. It's like, this is, um, it's one of those things where we can't say too much about the actual plot because there's so many tasks involved revolving around the story. But uh, you do get, if you read the website, you get the idea that there is something called the blue blade and it has been lost to time and you when you show up you find a reason that you get pulled into a group that is actually looking for this lost item and you're given reasons as to why it might be nearby and you get to explore a world and you get led through a world uh, that is quite adventurous quite surprising at times a couple of really good scares for me i thought um and lots of creepiness Lots of effective creepiness. And uh, one jaw-dropping moment that I just thought was a brilliant piece of set design. And that led into the moment that you were talking about, the more adventurous moment. Yeah, th there's a lot here to like. There really is. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just rambling now because I don't want to <laughs> give specifics. Yeah, it, it's really tough. But the we'll just say that there are definite surprises around every corner. And there are lots of corners. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, uh, I want to draw attention to a really strong cast, very strong cast. And for more information on delusion, you can find them on the web at enterdelusion.com on Facebook, enter delusion, also Instagram and Twitter, enter delusion. Make sure to go and sign up for their mailing list because if there is an extension, that's where you'll find out about it first. Um, they usually offer pre-sale tickets to their mailing list before any, before the general public. And Mike, this is one of those uh, podcasts where we're going by city. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we ended up trekking all the way to Las Vegas. Yes, we did. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I did not go to Vegas last year for, for haunt season. Yes. So this was my first year back in a couple of years, which was really exciting to me because Vegas has the Freakling Brothers Trilogy of Terror. Yes, the Freakling Bros horror shows. Uh, they're awesome. Uh, we did uh, make it down to the Freakling Brothers, definitely. And they were awesome. Yeah. All right, moving on. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we did, we did a few things in Vegas yeah. in the span of 24 hours. Yes, yeah, we did. Uh, it was a rough turnaround trip. Um, but... <laughs> Huge, 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 huge thank you to Omar Hansen, one of the original blackout survivors, um, for his hospitality and tolerating us. Yeah. <laughs> dealing with that smell and <laughs> ultimately buying Dead by Daylight because we peer pressured him. Yep. And taking us to eat and you know Yeah. Thank you so much, dude. You're yeah. amazing. Thank you, Omar. And Omar always knows the good place to eat. And it was it was funny, segue. Uh I was showing slash bragging to someone how I was at the purge escape room, you know, yeah. many, many years ago. And I, you know, found the picture and I was like, wait a minute. That's the first time I met Omar. Was it? Yep. Yeah. Well, Cause we were walking in downtown LA cause he came out for it. Oh, wow. That was like five years ago, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so I've known Omar a little longer than that. It's not a contest, man. No, it's not. Friendship so. isn't a contest. But Omar, we love you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for your hospitality, sir. It was really appreciated. So, and what we did. Okay, first thing, you go, Mike. What to the bathroom? No, you go. You 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 talk about the first thing we did because we've been looking forward to this for a while, and we wanted to do it, and we never wound up in Las Vegas at the same time. Right. And Omar wanted to do it with us as well. Mm -hmm. 
So, and we also pulled in Troy from Majestic Repertory. Yeah. And we did an escape room. Yes, we did. We did the official Saw escape room. Right. What did you think? And we did want to play a game. Yes. Wow. Yes, we did. <laughs> uh, it was, holy, wow. Like, you walk in, you feel like you're in a movie. Like, yeah. I, I, like... I'm, this isn't a spoiler because if you're going to a saw escape room, you're going to expect to be in the bathroom at some point, <laughs> but like being in that bathroom and seeing the toilet with the heart and seeing the tiles and the two way mirrors and it's in the bathtub. It's like that particular stain. I am, I am here. Yeah. I'm in the movie. Like where, where, Oh, it's yeah. It's just so well done. Actually, I, I feel that way about every single room. Every single room felt like a, a fully realized film set. It yeah. felt real. Uh, it felt like we, you, uh, this is an escape room where it's very hands-on. You, you have to interact with props and the environment around you. Uh, and this escape room is a lot of fun. And the production design is amazingly effective in creating a very creepy mood. It did. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. to the point where I probably jumped uh, back at one point yes. because of something. Yes, <laughs> I understand. So um, what did you feel about the puzzles? The puzzles were really interesting to me because they weren't the typical, you found a key, now find the lock. It was very, it, it went with the room. Jigs, it felt like Jigsaw made these puzzles. Right. And... It made sense to the Saw universe. It made sense to the character of Jigsaw that's putting you through this to test you. All of them made sense. And there weren't any uh, quote unquote generic puzzles like, like a lot of escape rooms have where it's like, oh, find this code, you know, and put this key in. It was like, you know, go here and do this. Put your hand in here. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I agree with you for the most part. Uh, Except for the, uh, there's an early sequence that did feel like, oh, find this code, go here, find this code, go yes. here. Except the difference is what it led to was where the difference happened. Yeah. So each each time you found something, you you it was a little bit more surprising than an average escape room. So I thought even in that, and and I thought that first area that we were in was like, okay, well, I, I hope things get more interesting. And I think what they're trying to do with that first sequence, I don't want to say exactly what we were doing. I think it's literally trying to throw you off. It's a false sense of security. To some degree. Because you're... It's a pattern. Well... For the most part. Well, here's the thing. And I don't think this is going to be a spoiler, but because that's the whole purpose, but you're on a tour of the meat plant. Yes. And by that opening sequence, it's like, oh, this is fine. This, what, this is okay. <laughs> but once you make it through, that's when it's like, oh, crap. And you hear Jigsaw's voice. And right, that's when stuff hits the fan. Yeah, and, and that whole, like that turn is really effective. And the production design of the set is really effective. There's some wonderfully claustrophobic areas. Uh, this is one of those escape rooms where, by gosh, you absolutely have to work as a team. Yes. There is no way you can get through this without working as a team. To the point where they give you pen and paper. Yes. To take notes. Yeah, absolutely. Because there is certain information that you only hear once or you only see once. And it's key that you get what you need from those moments. So, and I will say this, we got thrown in with several random people and we gelled fairly well almost immediately. And it was a really fun, pleasant experience. Uh, by the time we got to the end, we did escape technically with what? It was one second left on the clock, I yeah. believe. But I will also, we have to say that there was an additional task, which even though we escaped, we did not perform the additional task that was given to us. Right, but we would... It, like five more seconds we would have. I think so. Yeah. And, and, and here's the thing, here's the difference in that. I think what happened is this is my personal opinion. We were working so well together as a team. And then when we got to the ending sequence, that's when we 
let ourselves get misdirected by the red herrings. Mm -hmm. And I think as a group, we weren't working as a team in the final sequences as strongly as we were during the first half of it. Right. That's my personal opinion. Uh, because we were trying to share information and then people were repeating information and it just, we weren't as organized in that final sequences in the, in the last couple of sequences as we were in the first half. And I think that's what hurt us, but we technically did escape, but we didn't, I wish we had performed that one final task cause it would have felt better, but still like the whole ending yeah. was so cool. But, and apparently, you know, and this is us going to, this is us bragging at this point, but like. You know, we did escape, and apparently the average group only makes it through two rooms. I find out of, that shocking. Out of seven. Like, that's insane. That yeah. shows you how tough Jigsaw is. Yeah, it, it's, uh, if, you, if you don't pay attention, and if you don't work as a team, you will not get through those first couple of rooms. It's absolutely imperative. It is key that you work as a team. And there's a reason they give you pen and paper. Because you do have to write down information. Mm -hmm. And the order that you get information is important. The where it comes from is important. Uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool overall. I was really, really excited to do this. And I had a blast. Yeah, it was fantastic. One of my favorite escape rooms probably of all time, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, as far as set design, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Uh, I, I will say that I think there was one effect that didn't work quite as effectively as it should have but it's like that's a minor glitch when when everything around you is working so well and the and the production design is so incredibly effective um and there are some really creepy moments like going certain places going into tight spaces that kind of thing really lends itself to creepiness mm -hmm. and that was the fun and i think that also puts you in that vibe of i feel like i'm in a movie i feel like i'm having an adventure right now yeah, and the the once you get out um, or you run out of time, you're in a gift shop of sorts, and there, it's a cool. There's a couple of props. There's Billy, the little guy, the puppet that rides the tricycle. If you've seen the movie, um, there's an autograph poster of Saw Two by a director pre OSDM and stuff. So <laughs> that that was cool to see. Um, but yeah, there's lots of cool things you can take a picture. Like it's it's really good. Yeah, it's really really fun. Like highly recommend this if you do make it to Las Vegas and you enjoy escape rooms with a horror twist. For more information on the Saw Escape Room, you can find them on the web at sawescaperoom.com, on Facebook Saw Escape Room, on Instagram official Saw Escape Room, and on Twitter Saw Escape Room. And Mike, we did immersive theater. We did. Believe it or not. <laughs> See, this, this just goes, it, it, it goes from one to the other. We mentioned we did the Saw Escape Room with Troy from Majestic Rep. That's true. Then we went to see a show at Majestic Rep. So this particular show, Mike, is an immersive version of Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, but it's not all taken from the text of Measure for Measure. And I only roughly knew the story of Measure for Measure. I really didn't know much about it. So, well, yeah, on the way there, yeah, you're like, can you look up what Measure for Measure is about? <laughs> and like, this is way too much to read yeah, on a just trip like, it's in the too middle of the desert. <laughs> so, um, but they sort of set it in 1977, Lost Vegas. Lost Wages. Lost Wages. And you enter this, and I... I I just had such a fun time at this. Yeah, I did too. Even though this show made me realize how much I hate disco and the seventies, even though I was born in it. <laughs> but despite all of that, the show is so good and so fun and so interactive. Yeah. And you know, even if you don't like Shakespeare, or don't know Shakespeare, like, like it didn't me, matter in this situation. Exactly. Because it could, it could be something from this year like this story. Yeah, it's it's actually they concentrated on the political aspect, they concentrated on some of the moral questions uh, that are raised in the play itself, and they set it in this kind of clandestine nightclub secret bar sort of area, and I don't uh, there's so much I would love to say about this show. 
I actually enjoyed some of the disco music because I hadn't of course you did. heard <laughs> some of those tunes. Well, you, I would like to point out that you started nerding out to Omar and I afterwards. Like, did you hear this song? The second song they played. This is, it was a B-side of this record and blah, 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 this. And, and this was the remix of that. And blah, blah, blah. Like, you sounded like I do when I talk about K-pop. Yes. Uh, well, they may have used a particular song that is from a group that only had two main hits that I happen to be very fond of. See what I'm saying? We have to deal with that on the ride back. Uh, Disco Tex and the Sex and Let's, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Look them up. <laughs> so uh, we did the hustle. I, I taught Omar what the bump was. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but not in the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> so there, there, there's a there's a moment involving dancing, and we were kind of put on the spot, and it, it ended up where Omar and I were together, and we were put on the spot at the same time. So I leaned over to Omar and said, "Do you know what the bump is as as a dance craze?" And he just looked at me and went, N- "No." <laughs> And I was that like, was the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So I, I, I think I taught Omar how to do the bump. So, um, yeah, look that up on, yeah, Google that, friends. Uh, but anyway, it was a dance craze in the late seventies. Um, so I, I, I'm totally lost. Where were we? <laughs> no, I'll let you keep going. So, <laughs> um, the cool thing about this show, also, Mike, is one of those I, I've. Uh, we've talked about shows with multiple tracks that somehow like one track will seem less intriguing. Right. I don't think that happens in this show. And, you know, our friend Omar, who we mentioned a couple of times earlier, uh, had been to this show multiple times already. And I was on a very different track from you for, for the most part, I didn't see you after the first 10 or 15 minutes of the show. I didn't see you for the entire rest of the show. Yeah. And I have no idea where you wound up. Well, I mean, I was a groomsman. We had to throw a bachelor party and then, sh- you know, shenanigans happen and okay, you end up in jail. And <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's why. I wound up in sort of a secret speakeasy club that also got raided by the police. Uh, I didn't quite get through the full arrest proce- uh, process. But I wound up handcuffed to the owner of the club, and I spent most of the time handcuffed to him, and we were trying to talk our way out of the arrest much of the time. But the interesting thing for me is what that led to was a really dark sequence involving the murder of an innocent person, Mm -hmm. which completely shocked me, because this show starts out with such a happy, frivolous, disco-fueled vibe that when this show took that turn, I was really shocked, but it somehow worked. And I found myself trying to talk my way out of a jail cell. I tried to, you know, and, and succeeding by the way. Uh, did you teach the cops the bump? So, no, I did not. So <laughs> it, it, it became this weird thing of very different tones from beginning to end. There was some really funny stuff. There was some really dramatic, serious stuff. At one point, uh, wow, I, I, th- this is a little spoilery, but at one point I had to deliver a severed head to somebody like, uh, and when that happened, like, really, I, you want me to what? <laughs> it was this wonderful moment and it worked so well. And I didn't feel like, even though I know other people were getting different tracks, I knew that you had a whole group with you at one point, I guess, because mm-hmm. you showed up at that final sequence when everyone ends up in the same room. You had so many people with you. I met a, we our group combined with another group at that point. Yeah, I I have no idea what happened with those tracks, but I felt I got a complete show just with a roller coaster of emotion. It was wonderful. Yeah, it was it was great. Like it was such like and this is only my second show with Majestic Rep. The uh, a couple of podcasts ago I talked about Cabaret mm-hmm. and that was just a straight up show, but seeing what they can do immersively, it's I I want to go back. I want to see what else they do all their other shows, what right. what they're able to accomplish in in this theater. And talking about the we talked about the actors in a couple of the other shows that yeah. today and the cast in this show same thing like they're 
on so on top of their game like they can roll with with the improv and roll yeah. with conversations and roll with you know earlier i mentioned we were talking about touch and i mentioned how i gave an a, someone a hug and it was at this show because it was someone whose husband she thought like was arrested and didn't know where she was and mm-hmm. it's like you want to console them because they're that good and you she is crying mm-hmm. and she is emotional and like everyone there is just it's just so good. It rivals anything in LA. Yeah. And and it's funny because on the other side of the building, I was in a sequence with the husband who was missing and trying to convince him not to blow his cover because he was sort of hidden at that point. Mm -hmm. And it was just this weird, it's this huge mix of emotions of, it was serious. It was like, and you're right. And the reason I went there is the, the whole weird improv thing of, I kept finding myself like, like motioning, like not speaking, but like motion, like no, no, dude, seriously, stay over there. <laughs> and I, and I, I was that invested, where I wanted to let the right people know, like, no, everything's going to be fine. This is going to be work out if you just keep your mouth shut. It's like, don't blow this, because there were all these clandestine deals being made behind the scenes, and I was privy to a couple of them, and it was really cool. And on top of that like what you're talking about touch i i kept being grabbed and pulled and never felt that that was inappropriate i always understood what was going on Mm -hmm. the cast handled it really really well and this was a show where literally i was being pulled up onto the dance floor i was being pulled into corners i was being pulled behind curtains like like it always made sense to me you know and i've been in shows where it didn't but like th- this cast handled all of that improv, everything really, really well. And there's some changes in tone in this show that I don't know if you found that on your track, but like I like the whole disco fun frivolity turning into a police raid, mm-hmm. turning into me being arrested, turning into me trying to help someone talk us out of a jail cell. Like, so, I mean, I witnessed blackmail and an almost rape or possible rape right. like oh yeah it goes it goes dark yeah it really does and i loved the fact that it did because it's so surprising from the beginning like where you started like literally we were doing the hustle <laughs> like, come on <laughs> and you you can't be serious and down when you're doing the hustle nothing good can come from the hustle so. i have the song stuck in my head now <laughs> don't you dare edit this song in I will delete it. That sounds like that sounds like a challenge. I will. If you're listening to the podcast and you, all of a sudden you just hear random like <laughs> or like a random silence, that's why. By the way, I I asked you in the car. Do you remember the hustle? One hit wonder. Who was it? I don't know. Ben McCoy. Yeah, that's what I said. To my tongue. Oh, and you don't you don't know discotheques in the sets of life. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Sometimes you disappoint me, Mike. I will be honest. Do you know cram pop? So. All right then. All right, that was fair. I deserve that. <laughs> uh, but no, this this is this is one of those companies that you know I've spoken about them before. Uh, actually, the reason I started discovering Majestic Rep shows is because of our friend Omar. Years ago, took me to before Majestic Rep was Majestic Rep. Took me to a couple of shows that the people who were involved in this production were involved with those shows several years ago. So I've been sort of on this journey of discovering more and more work by people in Las Vegas. And this is such a strong company. They're starting to win awards and accolades. And I hope they continue exploring with the immersive stuff because it's so much fun. And they do it so well. They did a really good job with this. Here's the other thing that I would like to point out. and, And this is not a criticism of LA shows, but it's something that has come up on this podcast. I think several months ago we were talking about how 
every single immersive show in the Los Angeles area was about death and grief. Mm -hmm. Period. Like there was nothing else going on. <laughs> it was all about death and grief. This show had death and death grief, <laughs> and grief, rape, blackmail, political intrigue, uh, like police raids, party atmosphere, a party atmosphere, and yet it wasn't. It was dark in tone, but I never felt the show itself was dark because when you get to the end, there is a point that is made about morality and politicians and how the public is treated. And the final moments of this show, as uplifting as parts of the show were, as challenging as parts of the show were, the final moments I thought were actually chilling. Mm -hmm. Because you realize sort of where everything ends up is not the best scenario for most people involved. It's fascinating that the show could be so much fun and yet it's it makes a really pointed observation about shall we say our current political climate and that's the thing too because with those death and grief shows that you mentioned you left feeling horrible you just you, you know a lot of times it ruins your day and you know in a in and I don't mean that in a bad way, even though it sounds horrible. I don't think it can be in a good way, but it just it just ruins your spirit, I think. Yeah. Because it's like, wow, I just saw that. But with this, even though it had all of those dark elements, you still left. Like, that was amazing. This was an adventure. Mm -hmm. And that I, that's the way I felt afterwards. Like, I had just been on a really cool adventure. So if you're heading to Las Vegas and you want to learn more about Majestic Rep, uh, look them up at MajesticRepertory.com on the web. Look them up on Facebook at Majestic Rep. On Instagram, look them up at Majestic Rep Theater, and that's spelled T-R-E. And on Twitter, Majestic Rep. And if that wasn't enough for one day. Yeah, this was all one day. <laughs> after the, On top of driving in that day. Yes. Um, <laughs> We then went to the Freakling Brothers Trilogy of Terror, our home away from home. Yes. And this year, it had the same three houses or mazes as the previous year. So we had Castle Vampire, Coven of Thirteen, and of course, Gates of Hell. Ugh. Yes. Flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> this year, I felt like their casts in every single haunt were so strong. Oh, Yeah. I, and I, I can't even pinpoint exactly why I felt that, but I, I felt that just every every character, every creature that we encountered nailed it. Mm -hmm. Like giving 110%. And that can definitely be proven because there was an appearance of the rare Mike Haunt sound. Yes, there was. And it was glorious. <laughs> <laughs> but that shows you how good they are and how perfectly timed their scares are. Yeah. Because and... go ahead. I was scared mm -hmm. many times. Yeah. And I'm not trying to sound like, Oh, I don't get scared at haunted houses, but like, because we've been doing this for so long and because we go to so many, you can usually tell where something is going to pop out and right. whether or not you purposely do it or not, there's always a mental preparation. Like, okay, I'm turning around that corner. There's going to be someone there. Right. You know, and so you kind of like, you know, protect yourself that way. That's, that's what happens with me, but you're better at it than I am. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but going through Freakling, it just throws you off your game. And yeah. I loved it every second of it because it, they were so clever and they got me. Mm -hmm. so many times yeah and, and 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 it's a valid observation that you make about the preparation like like feeling where the scare is going to come from even i if i know that i'm i'm still an easy get you know that about me and you're not and but i know you enjoy being scared and i know that even if you don't jump and scream i know that the scare works on you mm-hmm but you don't have the outward and physical reaction that I do. Right. You're not as visual and vocal as I am with you being scared, but right. I know that you enjoy it and I know that it works on you. Right. I, at least that's my impression. Yeah. So when I, like you were in front of me 
for for the best scare that you got, I think. Coven? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, are you talking about the part that had something fall? Yes, I am referring to that. And uh, I, I screamed so loud at that moment. <laughs> They've lit that area differently this year, it seems. There's a new character in that area. Uh, perfectly timed the scare. Uh, so effective. And there was another moment in, you know, and, and also I just, the, the castle, the whole vampire motif, that is truly, I think, one of the most beautiful, elegant, lovely haunts mm -hmm. and freaking creepy uh, that I've ever been through. I, I love that haunt. Uh, Coven, it was so wonderful. And there's a, there were a couple of new twists in Coven, uh, particularly one that made all three of us laugh a great deal. <laughs> So, uh, but the other time that I saw you get scared is you were in front of me in Gates of Hell. And an actor came out of nowhere and I saw you physically jump. Okay. And I think I, 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 think I blocked it already because I don't remember that one. I, you did. I saw you oh, physically yeah, I'm not... tense up and, and, and move to your right. And I loved it. But, and the funny, but the, the way the scare worked for me is because there was a, you were walking toward light. So you were sort of backlit. Okay. So when the actor came from the side and scared you, oh. all I saw was the shadow about to attack you <laughs> because you were just shadows to me. And like you were walking forward and suddenly this shadow came out and grabbed you. Thanks for the help. Then. So, and I, I, I kind of jumped and yelped at that point and I saw you physically jump as well. Uh, so I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I yeah. enjoyed the mic, the rare mic <laughs> haunt noise because <laughs> I know they are rare. So, but uh, it's just so strong. And Gates of Hell this year. Oh my God. Like, first of all, flashbacks of victim experience. Yeah. Like, it, it's, it's a little tough to be waiting in line for that thing. But uh, we were able to go through just the, just the two of us. Which um, was lovely. And we appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> and I had to keep slapping you because I didn't want to hold your hand, but... <laughs> <laughs> the, but the every year in each maze they make changes. So you're yes. so even though you're going through the same maze, it's not the same maze as last year. They may change uh, a certain way you walk through something, or change the way a scare is done, or change the environment of a of a room. Mm -hmm. uh, that was so evident in Gates of Hell. Yeah, to the point where there's one area that's very very dark. And it literally took probably about three <laughs> minutes for us to find out our way out. Yeah. Now you think three minutes, oh, that's nothing. But no, seriously, close your eyes and like go in your kitchen someplace you won't get hurt. Put a timer on your phone for three minutes and just wander around. Then you'll realize why it, that sound that's yeah. like such a thing. Cause like when you add darkness and fog and a m actual maze element yeah well th that and that was exactly it was we started in darkness and then we sort of got a little bit out of the darkness and walked into a fog bank <laughs> yeah so it took quite a while but that was i loved that sequence. i did too yeah i you know that area was one of my biggest fears in real life but and i kept thinking something was gonna happen luckily it didn't but <laughs> yeah we got lost. Yeah, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. It was very intense, and just the the trepidation of what if we're not alone sort of happened. Yeah, because we were there for quite a while trying to get through the darkness, and we just kept running into the same walls over and over again. Uh, and also the 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 scares in general of where they come from. There's one in Gates of Hell that comes from. Actually, there's there's now that you think about it in Freakling Bros, um, the uh, in several places they're very intelligent about not, not always having the scare at your level. So you have to look below you. You mm -hmm. have to look uh, kind of like waist level. You have to look underneath you. You have to look above you. The scares come from all directions, and that's so cool that they can do that, and it works every time. The other thing I, I thought of, Mike, and we talked a little bit about this on the way back from Vegas, their talent, like their skill at just being good 
scares, great haunts, cool design. I hope that is not a lost art. Yeah. Because everything that we're talking about in this program is immersive theater. And I had someone text me two days ago because they know I love doing the immersive stuff. They know I love doing the haunts. And they said, I'm looking up stuff for the Halloween season in Los Angeles and everything I'm finding, if it's not Universal, Knots, Warner Brothers, or Fright Fest at Six Flags, if it's not those, it's immersive theater. Mm -hmm. So that person, the question they asked is, what about a basic haunt? Where are the haunts at? Yeah. I, you know, so we went to Vegas and did Freakling, and Freakling is spectacular at haunting. They are so good at what they do. And I found it interesting that a couple of days after that, I get this text from a buddy of mine going like, I'm just looking for good haunts. And I didn't know what to say to him in the Los Angeles area other than check the My Haunt Life calendar for some home haunts. Yeah, and I mean, there's like Sinister Point, but that's yeah. the far it, South it, Orange it's a, County. Yeah, and... it's far away. You know, they they have a wife and they have a kid. And so going to Universal is going to be a very costly affair. You know, I also recommended Ghost Train to them because that's something that is not necessarily a haunt, but it's really, really cool. You know, I haven't been to Boney Island, but I know that there's a new version of Boney Island this year. So it's like, I just don't want LA to lose that stuff Yeah. in, in lieu of getting more immersive stuff. So just, just a thought that I had based on that text conversation the other day. No, I get it. Yeah. It's like, uh, haunts are a good thing. Haunts are a fun thing and they should not go away. Uh, and when you get reminded by going to something like frequently in Las Vegas, you get reminded of just how much fun a good haunt is. And there's room for both. Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. Another thing I just want to just give a shout out to uh, is everybody at Freakling, uh, Duke, JT, Warren, Peter, everybody else. Um, you know, Russell, Omar, and I all wore our victim experience shirts because we <laughs> freaking earned them. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when and whenever you go back to Freakling wearing a survivor shirt, it's just you're instantly family again you know like the because they are so rare that when an employee sees it it's like oh wow you did it and it's like always a conversation star is like i could never do that i know what you guys have gone through like you know respect yeah. to you and and it's just there everybody there is so welcoming and i you know even though you've put us through some of the crappiest moments of our haunt <laughs> lives you know it it's like just love you guys and so thank you for everything yeah uh, love is a love is the right word and and i will say this also put me through probably my single favorite haunt scene i've ever encountered you know i, I and and <laughs> i i have told the creators what it was but they did a scene one year where where about five different whole fears like total drive me insane fears showed up in one room <laughs> and it was just, and i was looking around going like who told you like how do you know <laughs> damn it mike <laughs> <laughs> like like who who like how did you get this so frightening for me and to this day it's one of my absolute favorite haunt moments i've ever had and i will say this it's like it wasn't incredibly violent it wasn't incredibly aggressive it was just creepy as hell. And and it's just like, yeah, I, I, I have a great deal of affection for Freakling. And you're right. It does every time it feels like going home to some degree when you visit there. So and I, and I know that we are not alone in feeling that. I know other people who, well, hell, we were there and we were running into people from Los Angeles at Freakling. Mm hmm. And we were getting text messages that we were finding out that the next night when we, after we left, other people from LA were going to come the next night to Freakling. So it, it's like, it is a Mecca and it is worth visiting. They are so cool and they're so good at what they do. If you want to learn more about Freakling Brothers Trilogy of Terror, look up freaklingbros.com on the web. Facebook, look up Freakling Bros. Also on Instagram and on Twitter, it's all Freakling Bros. And then we came back to Los Angeles, Mike. 
We did. And we did something last night that I'm still thinking about. We did the second chapter, I guess you would call it, of mm -hmm. In Another Room by E3W Productions. Do you know that feeling you get when you meet someone and you just get so enamored with them and you have like an instant crush and all you do is think about them? All you want to do is spend time with them. All you want to do is do everything with them. Do you know that feeling? I was about to say, like the first time I met you. Um, but... <laughs> cricket, cricket. <laughs> yes, I do know what you mean. I have had that happen. Because that's how I feel about this show. Mm -hmm. Like I have a crush on this show. <laughs> I understand. Go on. <laughs> Describe the show. Tell us how the show affected you. Tell us how the show touched you. We... <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> No, I, I do. I understand what you mean. Um, where do we start with this show? I think it's best to start with what they wrote on their ticket page. In Another Room is a site-specific immersive play in which guests will wander the rooms of a purposely perp haunted house in Culver City, coming face-to-face -face with various souls that have lived and died and suffered tragedy within its walls. With only four audience members admitted into the house at a time, the show will be an extremely intimate experience that explores the notion of ghost stories and what is left behind from a life already lived. So you step into a haunted house. Yeah, and have conversations with people that may be dead, may not know they're dead, maybe ghosts, maybe spirits. Um, in another room... Uh, was created by Aaron Keeling, Austin Keeling, and Natalie Jones. And I think the interesting thing for me is this is what, their third production? Yeah. And I have attended the two previous ones. You didn't, I think you were out of town um, when their last show was up and running. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing for me is I love watching companies grow and change. And, you know, I, you know that I subscribe to numerous theaters and, and, and attend a lot of theater when I can. Um, and when you see a company mature this quickly and, and they're so savvy about what they have learned from their two previous productions, this show felt like dream, like perfection to me. And every sound cue, every lighting cue every choice that was made in the set and the decoration of this show strengthened the the context that the ghosts were presented in and you're talking about obviously if the house is haunted you're meeting characters from different time periods that just makes sense with what was set up the beauty here is the way they mix the timelines and what you get to experience and see and the performers hit every note perfectly as far as the emotional impact goes. They're lost when they need to be lost. They're sad when they need to be sad. They're confused when they need to be confused. And they take you on that journey. And I found it incredibly moving and incredibly disturbing. Uh, at times, there were several completely shocking moments for me gasp inducing shocking moments. Um, there was one moment of violence that I actually feared for the actor in a moment. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that in, I can't believe I just witnessed that. And all of that, that's magical for all of those pieces to come together. And this company has matured so much in three productions that it's astounding to me that they're this good, that this show is this good and pulls you in so well. There's so many wow moments yes. in this show. And one of the things that, that they do is they don't stop at where something could end. They go the extra step <laughs> to make something visual, to make something just stand out that much more just it you know there's there's there, if you go to this show you'll you'll see what i mean but there doesn't you didn't need to add this effect this it would have been fine as is you didn't need to 
have this be shown. But the fact that they do go that extra step, it adds so much to each piece. And it's beautiful. Like there was, there's a moment in the show where you, I'm not going to, now I can't say it because that's too much of a spoiler and it, it'll, it'll make you look forward to something. But there's a point in the show where you step into something and it's so serene and calm and peaceful. And while it's all of those things, you're wondering how the hell did they pull this off? Yes. And to me, Mike, that moment rivaled. I, I had a moment in my brain where I went, this is how I felt stepping into a particular room. And then she fell in New York, mm -hmm. which is one of the, that's probably my favorite immersive piece I've ever seen. This rivals that like, and also I it's like, look, I, I know the room you're talking about. It's the design of that room is jaw droppingly beautiful. And I wanted to stay there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wanted to spend more time in that room. And what happens in that room is so touching, so simple. And, but I also want to point to that design, that symbolism, that interesting attention to detail is throughout every room in this show. Mm -hmm. And the first room you enter is beautiful. And it, <laughs> reminds, it, it transports you. It, it does. It's, it's, it's a gateway. And, and actually that that's literally the purpose it serves is a gateway. And then the next room paints a picture. And yet there's one aspect of that first room. It's and it's key that that first room be normal. Mm -hmm. It's key that you enter someone's home. It's yeah. key. It's important that that be normal and yet there is one thing in that room that is not normal and it's never addressed. It's never pointed to no character deals with it. And yet there's one aspect of the set design of that first room that I just kept looking at it going, what does that mean? That aspect of that room is actually unsettling because everything else is playing out normally. Everything else is, I mean, it's a little weird. It's a little awkward because you're among strangers and, and they're talking about stuff that you aren't totally familiar with. But that visual cue of something underneath this is not normal. And then certain things happen. You get certain stories told to you. At one point, you, um, uh, I think we each got a little bit more detail about one character than another. Uh, in my situation, I stepped into another room in the home. You that... stepped into another room? <sighs> really? Yes, Sorry. I did. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I didn't even see that one coming. Um, and, and the attention to detail in that room was beautiful and so surprising. And I, I just had such intimate moment with the performer in that room. And personally, my favorite sequence, my personal favorite sequence was the, un, uh, I'm going to say unrequited love sequence. Is that mm -hmm. too much of a spoiler? No. The unrequited love sequence. And that's also the name of a masked intruder song. That's really good. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the simplicity of what happens in that room. Wow. I am really struggling with this. Because I don't want to say anything, but literally the the timing of a breeze going through a room. Yeah. The timing of something moving, the timing of a light dimming or a light brightening. This show, every moment just fell perfectly. Yeah, it's a perfect show. To support the emotion, it fell perfectly. And I... I that I was so touched by that sequence and that's the sequence that really there, there's a really shocking moment in the middle of it. And I found that horrifying, but not from a scare point from an emotional point for this to be this oddball, immersive ghost story that 
really haunts you not from a scary place, but from a disturbed, sad place. That's an achievement, man. That's like, I, there's gold here. There's like real depth here. And, and I, I just freaking love this thing. Yeah, I did too. When you mentioned going into another, like a, in another room, Thank you. Um, <laughs> the, when I got taken into a room with someone I had an intimate moment with because the story that she told all of us, I got to see the aftermath. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'm so jealous. And the <laughs> fact that some of it wasn't true, but that's how, what? that's how legends and urban legends start. But which is covered by like each uh -huh. character references that. Yeah. She said to me, sobbingly, what didn't happen. Oh, interesting. And it is, it's, it, it's just oh, like, it yeah, gets to you, man. It yeah. gets, it's so, because, you know, we, we live in a world where, you know, we always make jokes like, oh, we're in the matrix, but who, or who's to say like people we talk to aren't actual spirits. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying like this could be real or, or anything like that, but like when you put it in, in a show like this, it makes you take a step back and think like, what if you could talk to, to, to ghosts like that instead of random, like one word things on static, right? You know, like what if you could hear their story? What if a murder victim told you what exactly happened? Like the papers got it wrong. This is what happened. You know, it's like, it opens up a whole new world right. of like, of like what could be. I wonder if it would be comforting for them just yeah. to be heard. Right. Cause they, they don't have a voice anymore. What you said earlier about they, they take the extra step. One thing I loved about this show is the structure unfolds in a way that you think you're going from story to story to story. And when they start overlapping very oddly near the end of this show, and, and I don't want to go into more detail than that, I was really taken by surprise. Yeah. And I was taken by surprise by some of what the characters did. And I was taken by surprise of how we were manipulated and moved along in the last third of this show in, in such a wonderful way. Each set... Each room was so well done according to the character and it all came from the characters. And I, you know, I, I was so emotionally involved that I ended up really shocked and scared and stunned by a couple of things that happened. You actually heard a Russell Haunt noise during one particular- I did and I was very surprised. So how did you, 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 you saw that moment clearly, didn't you? Oh yeah. Okay. All right. I was wondering because I had the perfect vision of like the first eye line for that moment. Oh no, I did too. Okay. That's yeah. what I thought. Oh, but, uh, and I think what it was is, is because, you know, you, th this is a ghost story, right? Like you're, you're thinking that this is a ghost story and, oh, we're, we're hearing about spirits and we're talking about hauntings and like, and then suddenly something is very, very real. And I, I, that, you know, I, I joked about, you know, zombie Joe's earlier. I think that moment in, in another room might be my favorite moment of the entire year as far as haunt season goes. Yeah. Because uh, boy, did I scream. You <laughs> You did. And, and that, that was a scare that was far away from you. <laughs> I registered that later. <laughs> I'm like, really? I was looking at something. Well, that, that must have been, what, 12 feet away from us? Probably further. Further than that. And I was completely terrified by it. By just a simple movement, I was completely terrified. <laughs> yeah. But that shows how powerful something like this can be. Oh, it, it shows how completely emotionally pulled in I was at that point. Completely. And, and again, I think every cast member that we met was just pitch perfect. Yeah. It's just like, I would love to see this again uh, and go on a different track. I would love to learn other things. I, yeah, this is so strong. Well, hold on 
hold that comment because just to not confuse people, there really aren't tracks in this. That's true. That's true. There's the opening scene. You can go with one of three spirits. That's true. And here there's their personal stories, but that I wouldn't consider that the tr a track because yeah. the rest of the show is, is, is you're, you're together. You're, you're yeah. with the same group it's, and it's a small audience. It's four people at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Ra let me rephrase that. I would love to hear every word of right. this show. And there is a sequence where you get broken apart and you don't hear every word of the show that's being spoken. And I was so moved and so pulled in that I want every moment of this show. Yeah. So, but you're right. That, that is a very valid point that it's actually not a track driven show where you split off and get a lot of private stuff. That's not what happens. Um, and, and I, I think it was really interesting to see what affected other people in our group too, because at one point I noticed another person in the group getting very emotional and I thought, oh, that's interesting that that's what's getting to him. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just, I, I really, really enjoyed the show. And I think it's really something special. And I don't know if you noticed the common thread between everything, but all of the sadness and tragedy happened because of love. Interesting. Like, think about it. Think about each scene. That's very true. I think the strongest one for me, as I said, the unrequited love mm -hmm. was sort of like where that was driven home. But you're yeah. right. Each scene does have that thread in it. And man, I just like, there's so much beauty in this show. It's so good. Like, congratulations. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's like E3W Productions. Congratulations. And sincerely, thank you. Because this was a surprise. I had no idea what to expect going into this. And this was a complete surprise mm -hmm. and it's utterly enchanting, very moving at times, very scary, but there's more going on here than trying to scare you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's perfect storytelling. They're after your heart. That's what they're looking for. And unfortunately, it seems that the entire run is sold out. Uh, but they do have a mailing list that you can sign up for to get tickets and also check the everything immersive group on Facebook in case people need to get rid of tickets. That's probably going to be your best bet to get tickets to this. And trust me, you do want to get tickets to this. Yeah. And I, I hope an extension happens. I really do. This, this is one of those productions that deserves a long life. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because this is, this is truly deeply moving material and, presented so well this i i just i think that's somewhere in the middle of this show actually i can tell you and i, I won't reveal the moment but somewhere in in one of the middle sequences i really did have a moment of i didn't see that coming and i'm so happy to be here right now i i it, it felt like an honor to go through this yeah i agree for more information on E3W Productions, you can go to their Instagram at E3W Productions. Uh, they will have a website up soon uh, and Facebook as well. But right now they just have an Instagram. So go there. Uh, there's a link to the Brown Paper Tickets site, which has tickets and you can sign up for the waiting list. So that's everything. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, I should say that's everything we've done. Yes. It's not everything for this podcast because I have something cool. What? We have a giveaway to do. Oh, yeah. Um, at Fringe this past year and a couple of podcasts ago, we mentioned about the remount of the show, but Dr. Zamba's Ghost Show of Terror is coming back and we are doing a ticket giveaway. You can win a pair of tickets. All you have to do is email David Lucarelli. He's the guy behind Dr. Zamba. Uh, you can email him at dlucarelli at earthlink.net. That's D-L-U-C-A-R-E-L-L-I at earthlink.net. And in the subject line, ghost show giveaway. And the first person to email him will get tickets to the show on October 26. Can't get much easier than that. But so <laughs> depending on when this drops and who makes it all the way to the end first... Good luck, <laughs> but email him and the show is so, so much fun. Uh, and if you do win, definitely, uh, let us know what you thought of it. 
because we love that show and it's we, so much fun. It is. And thank you to Dr. Zamba for allowing us to do that. Yeah. And also I want to say uh, happy Halloween because this is going to be our last podcast for haunt season actually, because uh, as you may have heard on other podcasts, I had some uh, things happen back home over the last few months. Uh, I actually have to go back home and help my dad for a couple weeks and I'm leaving for two weeks. So I'm not going to be back in California until November, but uh, hopefully when I get back, I'll have things that I did in Massachusetts to talk about. Like I don't, Russell, have you ever heard of Sturbridge village? No. Okay. It's basically an old, like six, I think 1600s, like when the pilgrims, cause Massachusetts pilgrims, <laughs> um, it's, it's where we always went on field trips oh, okay. like as, as kids, but it shows how life was back then, but they're doing a production of sleepy hollow. Oh, cool. But like outside in that time period and stuff. So I'm going to like, you know, try to go to stuff like that. And there's a, a haunted ghost ship in Boston that like, it's like a, the Queen Mary kind of thing. And so I'm going to try to do some stuff out there, but uh, you won't hear about that until probably mid-November. After season sometime. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It'll give you something to look forward to. So thank you everyone for listening and thank and hope you have a happy and safe Halloween and the rest of your haunt season. Um, but that means like you're going to have like, correct me if I'm wrong, you're actually going to be going into fall. Yep. Like a season. And not only <laughs> that, but um, depending on what happens on Halloween, I might actually be going trick or treating be with my cousin's kids. No, put that pail down. I, I'm giving you this jack-o'-lantern pail. I am not putting that in my luggage. You, dude, dude, Russell, stop. <laughs> you already wasted how many minutes about this? <laughs> Come on. It's smiling at you right now. Exactly. There's no place for smiling <laughs> jack-o'-lanterns in Halloween. <laughs> Anyways, but I might actually be able to go trick-or-treating with my cousin's kids who I just met on my last trip. That would be awesome. I know, because I'd steal their candy because I'm bigger than them. <laughs> but yeah, just stuff like that. Means that means you have like to get a costume. Typical fall things and maybe go to Salem again and have fried dough and... <laughs> Go to friendlies. Oh, all the things. Get get cookie puss. Oh. What is that? You don't know what cookie puss is? No. Do you know what fudgy the whale is? No. Oh my god. These non-New England people. Come on. <laughs> Bring some back? <laughs> no. I'll, I'll show you a cookie puss video after this. Okay. And, all right. Yeah, the commercial. Okay. All um, right. But yeah, so I won't be here. Russell will be here if you see him. Give him a hug. Um, <laughs> he's hug consensual because um, he'll be lonely probably. Going, I will be. Going to haunts alone and so. scared. Yeah. And the Red Sox beat the Astros today, so they're going to the World Series. So that means I'll be in Boston when the Red Sox are in the World Series at Fenway. So I'm... If tickets aren't $10,000, which I don't doubt, I am going to try to go catch a game. So which, if that's like a, like a once in a lifetime thing. Okay. If you can bring up sports on this, I, I get to put in the hustle at the end. No, it's two different things. <laughs> Disco text and the sex alets. You just make me think of chiclets. <laughs> no appreciation for the finer disco. Nope. Have fun, dude. Yeah. Thank you. Weather. Um, You're going to have like a season. I know. Like fall. It like... might even snow. And I'll, oh, and I get to go to Yankee Candle, the factory again. And... Oh, okay. No, that's a huge thing, man. All right. Is it? It's amazing. Especially the drive up there when it's fall and all the leaves on the, on the highway. Oh. Uh, you're really excited. <laughs> I can't wait. I hate California. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. Kind of. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So send that hate mail to Mike at myhauntlife.com. <laughs> yeah. Or Russell at myhauntlife.com with two S's and two L's. Um, <laughs> and if you know of anything happening in Massachusetts, let me know. You can email me at Mike at myhauntlife.com. Um, but to find us on the web and all those other social media places, go to myhauntlife.com uh, or myhauntlife on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Or leave us a voicemail or text on the hotline, 515-HAUNT-LA. Anything else? No, I don't think so. All right. Well, happy Halloween, everyone. Be safe. Go get scared. I'm Mike. And I'm Russell. See ya.
Get out. Mm. We're done for now. Hello. I'm a Corvus Celestial person from out of state. My real name is Cookie Puss, but my friends call me CP. I'm a Corvel ice cream cake, and I made fresh daily at participating Corvel ice cream stores. Yeah. Here's some ice cream cakes that only Carvel makes. They're made fresh every day, cause that's the Carvel way. And while you're at the store, see Cookie for some more. And don't forget about Hug Me the Bear. The friendliest bear. Your participating Carvel dealer also has Hug Me the Bear and Cookie Puss dolls. You'll love them. Thank you.